well, <laughs> we're finally back outside again. Finally, uh, springtime has finally arrived here in uh, northeastern Maine. Uh, it is May the 4th, I think, right now. So it's uh, 70 or so degrees out, so it's a really beautiful day. A little bit windy, so if you're hearing a little bit of distortion there, I hope it's not too bad. But I want to talk to you today about entering God's rest. All right. So we're going to start out with Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It says here, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, on this wise, remember that, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today after so long a time, as it is said, Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he, af would, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he hath, or he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And, of course, as Christians, I believe doctrinally the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, but I believe as Christians there's some real instruction in righteousness here. Because, you see, this life that we have is really all the labor that we can do before we enter into the rest. You know, And what is the rest? Well, if you know your King James Bible, the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ is what the Bible teaches. And so the body of Christ goes and rules and reigns with Jesus Christ in that millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of peace here on this earth. This earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out uh, in terms of on the surface you know, in the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, it's just going to be really, really wrecked. And when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to restore it basically back to a kind of a Garden of Eden type of a, you know, pre-flood type of a world. And it's going to be tremendous. And it's, it's really going to be an amazing time, the Millennial Kingdom. But to enter into that rest, first of all, you have to be saved. Secondly, you have to suffer for Jesus Christ in this life. Suffer through laboring, not beating yourself like a Roman Catholic would do. No, you actually have to labor for Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes it can get downright wearying. Um, the Bible says, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. There's a balance. That's one of the reasons I'm out here today. Uh, yes, I do love the studio and things, the, the bookshelf and all that stuff. That's great to do studies out there. But man, there's times I just need to come out here and I need to see what God has made and, and breathe the fresh air and everything. It's, it's, it's such an encouragement to come out here and I just feel so rested. You know, the ministry headquarters is, is in a town. It's, it's not a whole lot of nature around it and things. So coming out here, out under the wilderness areas uh, really helps out, <laughs> believe you me. But um, you're going to get tired as a Christian. And if you get too tired, if you aren't practicing moderation and you get too tired, you can end up actually uh, fainting, as the Bible says. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. You can actually mess up because you're too tired. And my wife and I have uh, been experimenting with a new system of sleeping, which is very interesting. I'm going to be doing a sermon on this in the future. Uh, that's not exactly a conventional way of sleeping, but I'll tell you what, it really works. And, um, you know, health, I've heard health uh, explained this way. Health is like a three-legged stool. You have the food that you eat, the exercise that you get, and finally, 
the, the sleep that you get. And sleep is very important. You know, and if God gave us a pattern of him creating the world in six days and then resting on the seventh day, if God said, I need to rest, don't you think you should? You know, and you say, well, Sunday is the Lord's day and, and everything else, you know, and we got to be in church every time the doors are open. You know, that's the famous thing with a lot of Christians. And it's just like, are you resting? No, you're getting up early Sunday morning and you're going for Sunday school. You know, you do the bus route and then you go to Sunday school and then you do the choir thing and then you Sunday morning service and then you come in for choir practice in the afternoon and to do things, whatever else, and then Sunday evening service and you got, you know, all this other stuff. You end up, it, Sundays are stressful and that's not what God designed. That's not what God intended. You need to have one day a week at least where you get some rest. Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth, he got plenty of rest. You know, he made sure of that. So that's what I want to talk about today. But this is so important. And I've been really, really guilty of many times in the ministry just working too many hours and just staying up way too late, not getting rest. I'm falling asleep in some of my sermons. I mean, and, and you know, I apologize for that. I, I've not been a real good example in that area. And I try to eat really good food and we try to stay away from high fructose corn syrup and aspartame and all the other junk preservatives that are out there, MSG and stuff like that. And I try to exercise, I try to stay in good shape, I'm trying not to be overweight or anything, but then I mess up in my sleeping. The third leg of the stool is kind of messed up. And there's a spiritual application there. And that is, if you are, if you are not being careful to rest, you know, and, 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 well, I should say, if you're not being careful to, to work for the Lord, you're going to have a hard time resting in the millennial kingdom. But let's continue here. We're going to look up a bunch of different scriptures today. Um, Genesis chapter 2. Go back to Genesis 2. Ah, come on here. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Okay? And now if you don't know this, we're going to go to it. I know some of you more seasoned Christians know where I'm going. Second Peter chapter 3. The significance of the day and the the number 1000 second peter chapter 3 you know i got to i always have to remind myself that there are newly saved people that watch this channel and people that really haven't heard much uh, real deep preaching and so i can't just assume that you know these things you know that's why i'm bringing it up again uh, i know some of you that are been saved for a while probably know exactly what i'm doing here but 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So the earth, the labor that goes on, will be for 6,000 years, and then the thousand-year millennial kingdom. All right? And you say, well, but we're past the year 2000, so it throws the whole system off. Well, we're past the year 2000 in the sense of what our modern-day calendars say, but there was a lot of tampering with the calendars, in the you know early centuries there after you know Jesus Christ went back up to heaven the Catholics you know a lot of the monks and things they kind of messed with the calendar a little bit so honestly we really don't know what year it is uh, it's in the neighborhood of being almost 2,000 you know years after Jesus Christ was born but what's the actual uh, year well we really don't know uh, that's kind of uh, debatable so, but the point is, the Bible teaches that there will be 6,000 years of mankind laboring on the earth, and that 1,000-year millennial kingdom is yet, yet to come. And that's important to get, because that's, that's really what we're laboring for. I mean, yeah, you get the crowns at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. Yes, there's rewards, and, you know, in heaven, that's true. But it isn't all just about heaven. It's about coming back here and ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. And that's what we labor for. And you have to keep that in mind. You know, when you get down and people are really coming on, come down on you and stuff like that, you got to get that thing in your mind and remember that you're laboring for something that's going to be great. 
and there's not going to be any kind of a you got really you know there was a bunch of lies made and they really didn't give you the rewards that you deserved and think it's going to be the Lord that judges your service to him and he's going to be re rewarding you accordingly so you don't have to worry about being taken advantage of or whatever else or a crooked judge or something like this it's going to be the Lord that's going to give you those rewards but um, let's go next to Matthew chapter 24 you say well who is Hebrews chapter 4 directed to well, as I stated, I believe that the book of Hebrews is specifically written to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. And, of course, there's plenty of instruction and in righteousness for us as Christians. But the fact is, I do believe that that book is directed primarily at uh, a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, there's, they're going to have to have faith in Jesus Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. So a lot of the things that we believe today, you're going to find it in the book of Hebrews. You know, a lot of people have this notion when you're dispensational that, you know, because the Pauline epistles are written specifically to us and other books are not, then you just ignore the other books. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, in fact, Paul wrote about, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he wrote that. So you're actually supposed to read the Gospels and, of course, everything else in the Bible, too. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So... That's the way the thing works here. But let's read the context here of Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. If I can keep my papers together here. Matthew 24, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Of course, very true for today. I mean, there are people that literally... Um, are coming out and saying that they are Christ. I mean, every Catholic priest out there claims to be another Christ, according to official Catholic doctrine. So that's just one group. I mean, there's a lot of others out there, too. But Jesus is speaking here to Jewish disciples. And the whole book of Matthew, chapter 24, is specifically aimed at Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, because the body of Christ leaves beforehand. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. 51. Okay, it says here, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? So there at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to have to be watching. There is a, a very strong element of works towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, there's still faith in Jesus Christ. I understand that. I'm not trying to say there, there's no faith in things. But the point is, there is a strong element of works there at the end. And if these people do not endure to the end, they're not going to be saved. And they're going to quit. And we're already seeing this very strongly within the body of Christ right now. People are saying the rapture is not going to happen. There's no way. The rapture is not going to happen. Not going to happen. You know, we're going through the tribulation and all this stuff like that. What are they doing? They're quitting on Jesus Christ. You know why? Because a lot of them had these predictions that in the year 2000, the rapture is going to happen then, you know, or 1993. And, and they, they hear all these, you know, kooky prophecies and things. And they give up because the prophecies don't come true. And then they're looking at the establishment of the new world order and they see all the bad stuff coming and they go, Jesus isn't coming back. He's not going to take his bride away. And then they hear these lies, you know, the rapture was created in 1830 and all that nonsense. It's been debunked for years. And... They give up their faith. They give up looking for Jesus Christ. It's kind of sad. 
And ironically, you know, the, the funny thing is, let me just, I got to throw this in here yet. And I've talked about this before, but, you know, I just want to make another, make, say it one more time. And that is, they say, a lot of the post-tribbers will say that the Jesuits created the pre-trib rapture. The Jesuits are behind it. The Catholic Church is behind the rapture. And I think to myself, and, and you know, and they'll say, and the reason we can prove that is because if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, then you're not going to fight against corruption. It's like, okay, um, every pre-trib rapture believer that I know of that's a Bible-believing Christian anyhow, I can't speak for modern version people, but every pre-trib Bible-believing Christian I know of does talk about corruption in government and whatever else, but the fact of the matter is we're more concerned with winning people to Jesus Christ. Why? We're not going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and the thing that gets us out of the time of Jacob's trouble, the thing that's going to make the rapture happen, is when the last soul is saved. When the body of Christ is complete, we leave. All right? And only God knows when that's going to happen. Only God knows when that last soul is going to get saved. You know? So, if the Jesuits are really behind the rapture, why would they want to create a theory that makes people stronger soul winners? That doesn't make much sense. I mean, think about this. If I said to you that I had a vision from God last night and He showed me that the rapture is going to be one week from today, guaranteed definitely one week from today, what would you do? You'd get real militant for soul winning very quickly, wouldn't you? Why? Because you realize there's not much time to labor anymore. You realize that your time of working to earn rewards is just about gone. See? Rapture, the pre-trib rapture, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away is the actual term if you want to use biblical terminology. But, you know, the pre uh inspires you to be more militant for Jesus Christ. It inspires you to win more souls for Jesus Christ. And it takes stronger stands. Why would the Catholics create a theory like that? They didn't. But let's continue. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. And we're not going to read all these verses simply for sake of time, but uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, um, you're going to see uh, this thing of the ten, ten uh, virgins there. Well, we'll just, I guess we'll just read it. I'm trying to keep things fairly short today because of this wind. But uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They didn't go forth to marry the bridegroom. Okay, Jesus Christ is going to marry one chaste virgin, the church. Okay, He's not going to marry ten virgins. Right? That would be polygamy. Jesus Christ is not a polygamist. Right? Unless you're 501c3, because then Jesus Christ is married to the church and also to the state. You know, <laughs> I had to put that in there. But the fact of the matter is, they go out to meet the bridegroom. They don't go to be married. See, the people that go through the time of Jacob's trouble, they are going to actually be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which happens down here on the earth, but they're not going to be married to Jesus Christ. That only happens with those who are part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Okay, and yes, you know, study the Bible. Uh, the bride and the body are the same. But uh, verse 2, And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now many of the expositors, let me just stop there. Many of the expositors will tell you that this oil is the Holy Spirit. Okay. And that these are Christians here. So you can lose the Holy Spirit and the, and the oil goes away and the Holy Spirit goes out. Apparently according to this ridiculous nonsense. Look at verse 9. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there, not, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So you can go buy the Holy Spirit? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. 
Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Clearly directed at people in the time of Jacob's trouble. All right. Very, very clear. And again, you know, you could do a whole big study on this thing, but I'm just trying to show you these people did not labor to enter into his rest. These Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, they didn't, they weren't careful and they didn't, they didn't take care. And, you know, we're going to see later on who they've, you know, how it really works out, how this judgment is done. Then if you go down to through 14 through 30, which, like I said, we're not going to read it for sake of time, but uh, chapter or, uh, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, uh, you go into the thing of um, these, you know, servants, and they're given talents and things, and one of them hides a talent and stuff, and he gets cast into the lake of fire. Again, he is, he's not, you know, enduring to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. He is not laboring to enter into God's rest. And, you know, right now, we are laboring to enter into God's rest in terms of rewards. But as Christians, you don't have to worry about, well, I didn't serve the Lord. I didn't work for the Lord. I didn't give out tracts or witness or anything else. So, you know, I'm going to go to hell. No, see again, rightly divide the word of truth. You can see that the people here in Matthew 25, if they are not laboring to enter into the rest, they're actually being cast in the lake of fire. We're going to see that as we continue. But that doesn't work for Christians today. Now look at uh, uh, verses 31 through 40. These faithful servants enter into the kingdom based on their good works. Okay, and you see that there. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's, let's go there. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. I was, I was thinking there was something else that I was going to say, but never mind. Verse 31, okay, here's where it happens, all right? This is where the judgment happens, all right? Now, we as Christians have already been caught up. We have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, all right? So we don't have to worry about the judgment of the nations that's going to happen here. We are actually the ones that come back with Jesus Christ to go out and gather people to bring them to the judgment. Let's see about this. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him... That's the body of Christ. We are in the resurrection. They are as the angels of God in heaven. You know, we will become like angels. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Okay? So there you see those people that have labored, and notice it's it's kind of interesting because if you really kind of look at the thing, it's they're getting into areas where you would think that there'd be required mark of the beast type of stuff to get into the hospitals and into prison and stuff like this. But I believe that the second half of the time of Jacob's trouble Antichrist shows up at the beginning, confirms the covenant between the Jews and, and the Arabs, you know, and uh, sets up this peace treaty. And then the mark of the beast is issued at that point in time, and you have to worship the Antichrist. And I believe about three and a half years through that thing, I think that there's going to be so much catastrophe in the world, and there could be some kind of a solar flare that'll just wipe out the whole computer system. And so by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe that the whole Mark of the Beast system is going to really have collapsed. And so the Jews at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble could actually be going and visiting people in prison and doing all these things like that, laboring to enter into his rest. And again, you know, like I said, Hebrews chapter 4, there's instruction in righteousness for us. That's true. But doctrinally, you have to be real careful because it does 
point directly at what's going on here in Matthew chapter 25. They are entering into the kingdom because of laboring to enter in. All right? Now let's see what happens if they don't work. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, it did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Okay, so very plain there. But, uh, you know, the, these people are getting in because of works. But what about a Christian entering into this rest of God? Galatians chapter 5. And it is very windy out here today. <laughs> Blowing all over the place. Trying to get here without my Bible blowing all over. Galatians chapter 5, verses, I think it's 19 through 21. Yeah, verse 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I do believe the Bible teaches that the kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship with the Lord, righteousness, joy, and peace, you know, it talks about over in the book of Romans. But I do also believe that the kingdom of God can also refer to the millennial kingdom. Uh, the Bible talks about the you know people entering into the kingdom of God, and the Jews that are there time when Jesus is talking that they're cast out, you know. So there is a, a reference to that actual physical millennial kingdom. So if you have somebody as a Christian, and they're messing around with those works of the flesh that we just read there in the book of Galatians, and they're messing around with that, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And by the way, don't ever listen to any preacher that tries to tell you that that kingdom of God in Galatians chapter 5 is a reference to heaven. Because then you have works-based salvation. You have somebody that says, well, if you commit adultery, then you've lost your salvation. If, you've, if you're doing uncleanness and seditions and heresies and all the other lists there, then you're not going to get into heaven. That's nonsense. That's not what the Bible's teaching there. Okay, this is talking about the millennial kingdom and also fellowship with the Lord. So it's very important to go through that list sometimes and, and, and just kind of check yourself and say, am I doing any of this stuff? You know, very important to remember that. Next, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verses, I think, 11 through 13. Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Like I've been saying. If we deny him, he also will deny us. You say, well, he denies us in the sense that he doesn't know us and depart from me, he cursed. No, because keep reading. Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Another very strong passage of Scripture proving eternal security. If we deny him, he will deny us, but he can't deny himself. He abideth faithful. God has sealed, sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that's true for the body of Christ today. It's not true for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's very important to remember that. So again, what, how do you enter into that rest? How is it that you have an inheritance in the rest there? Through suffering for Jesus Christ. And it's so funny because I've said this in other studies, but I'll repeat it again. So many people 
try to get away from suffering as Christians. The modern day Babel buildings, you go in there and it's all about fun and happy and joy and whatever else. And any kind of suffering is just, well, let's just not talk about those uncomfortable subjects. And let's not, let's not get out of our comfort zone here and go to try to actually preach the gospel and, and get people mad at us and stuff. That's uncomfortable. What are they doing? Well, if they're saved, and I say it's a big if, they're taking away your millennial inheritance. Something else, isn't it? And, you know, a lot of people get all worried about retirement. You know, what about retirement? What about retirement? Is your 401k in, in good standing or, you know, are you putting money in back for retirement and stuff? Well, let me ask you a question, Christian. Um, what have you put back for your retirement in the millennial kingdom? Have you been working diligently for that rest that's coming? That's what retirement's supposed to be. You rest from your labors. You get older and you say, man, I really worked hard and now I just want to rest. We all have an opportunity to work for Jesus Christ in whatever capacity you can. Don't get stressed out because you're not going out and you're not the great soul winning, leading 3,000 people to the Lord every weekend or something like that. No, 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 no. God is not going to judge you based on the quantity of your work. He's only going to judge your quality of work. Was your heart right before Him? Were you trying to preach the gospel? And you know, it's been well said, every knee is going to bow to Jesus Christ. So you literally cannot lose when you go soul winning. When you witness for Jesus Christ, you can't lose. If they reject Jesus Christ in this life, they'll accept Him in the next. It'll be too late for them. They'll you know, bow the knee to Jesus Christ before they're cast into the lake of fire. But the point is, you can't lose as a Christian. But boy, that flesh springs up, doesn't it? That flesh comes up and says, why don't we do this instead? And why don't we, I, well, we're kind of busy today. Let's not do this and let's not do that. The flesh doesn't like to suffer. And, you know, that's something you have to keep in mind, brethren. And I'll tell you what, there are times, you know, you have to put your flesh down and bring your body into subjection, you know, by going out and witnessing and doing things that are uncomfortable. But you also have to take care of your body through resting. That's the challenge. You say, oh, it must be easy to, to serve Jesus Christ and work for Jesus Christ. No, not really. It can be very difficult at times. And I'm going to show you that it can be very difficult. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Ah, come on here. Verse 23 through 31. And I've been over these verses before, but I'm just going to go over them again just to kind of encourage some of you out there because I know some of you are in some really bad situations. And I know it can get very, very wearying. And I, I feel for you. I really do. I wish I could just help everybody, but I can't. I do my best to try and preach the word, and I do my best to try and keep, you know, my wife and I, our, our lives together. But, man, sometimes it gets rough. And here's what you're facing, okay? When you get saved, don't think that things are going to just become wonderful and good and stuff. I mean, they are in eternity, sure. And, you know, you'll have the Lord perform miracles in your life, and it's an amazing life and everything, and I wouldn't trade it for any other life. But I'll tell you what. You're going to get kicked around sometimes. Here's what the greatest Christian that ever lived went through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Hello, welcome to YouTube. <laughs> uh, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." Churches being a group of groups of people, by the way. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, 
and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Very interesting. Um, how many of you would have gotten saved if you had known, if somebody gave you that list right there that Paul spoke, gave you that list and said, that's what you're facing? Would you have gotten saved? I wonder if that would have been put on Paul. Hey, uh, Paul, uh, here's what's going to happen. And it's funny because, you know, you go back to the book of Acts when uh, Paul is getting saved and things, and he, and he you know, the Lord tells the, I uh, can't think of the guy's name right now, the guy that goes to, to, you know, basically tell Paul what his orders are from the Lord, and, he, and the Lord says, you know, go to this guy, he's, he's, you know, basically chosen by me, and show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, uh-huh, you know, that's what's going to happen to you as a Christian. And you say, but I don't want to suffer. I don't, you know, well, if I told you you had to suffer for a month, and after the month of suffering, you'd get a million dollars in cash, would you be willing to suffer? Well, how about uh, suffer for a few years down here, maybe a hundred years at the most, and after that you get eternity with living in a city where the streets are gold. This street here, this road here is dirt, rocks. Can you imagine walking on a street of gold, like unto transparent glass, the Bible says, the book of Revelation? You know, how about coming back to this earth and it's restored and beautiful and, and just amazing. The animals get along with you. You know, right now, if there's a bear or a moose or something that would come, you know, it probably wouldn't be too happy to see me and I wouldn't be too happy to see it. But uh, you read about the Millennial Kingdom, they come up, they're friendly. There's lions and things and, and wild beasts, and there's little children walking around with them. You know, hey, look at me. I'm carrying, you know, walking around with my pet lion, you know. Why? Because Jesus Christ is on the earth for that time? Don't ever think about this post-millennial nonsense that man brings in this kingdom. That's ridiculous. Premillennial is the only stand that a Bible-believing Christian can take. Don't ever fall for the post-millennial nonsense absolutely ridiculous. But the point is, whatever suffering you have to go through in this life, it's going to be worth it for the next. When we come back here and we rule and reign with Jesus Christ for the thousand years, oh man, how wonderful. You know, and I know that a lot of you, you know, we talk about this and stuff in the comments section. I've had email and back and forth with people writing letters and, and it's just like, ah, oh, I just wish the rapture would happen. <laughs> you know, yeah, I do too. But, uh, you know, there's still work to do for the Lord. There's still time to lay up some more treasures in heaven. Thank the Lord for that. Two more places to turn to here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Ugh. Man, I can't stand reading that. <laughs> you know? In other words, the strongest I am spiritually is when I'm sick, according to that passage. The strongest when you are is when you're sick. When you're weak, then you're strong. You know when the most fervent times of prayer will be? When you're sick, when you're in a good mood and feeling great and best of health and everything else, you're getting stuff done, you're out there working and doing things and enjoying the day and whatever else, you might think about the Lord, but I'll tell you what, when you're in really, really dire straits with sickness, you're going to pray a lot. When you're weak, you're strong. You're suffering for Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind, brethren, because I know some of you really, really suffer. 
really suffer. I'm not just talking about, I got a splinter in my finger. Oh, you know, no, 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 no. I'm talking real suffering, you know? I know some of you go through it. You know, we've gone through things. I mean, it, it's, you know, there's some bad stuff, you know? I mean, but it's going to be worth it all. I'm going to tell you a little story here in just a couple minutes after I finish this, but uh, we'll read the last portion here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 3 through 14. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you were is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. I hope that you know that about us. My wife and I, we're not reprobates. Okay? We might say things that you don't agree with, but good night. I mean, you know, don't start writing me off as a Jesuit because I don't think the earth is flat or because I don't agree with, uh, you know, the gap theory or something like this, you know? I mean, look at the majority of what we put out and compare it to Scripture. And if it's comparable to Scripture, you say, well, praise Lord for Brother Brian, Sister Catherine. Don't agree with them 100%, but praise Lord, I'll pray for them. You know, pray for us. We need your prayers. Verse 7, Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, but that ye, we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. And that's what I pray for a lot of you, that you would get stronger and stronger with your in your faith with Jesus Christ. I can't stand to hear this thing of I hear from Christians and then all of a sudden it's like I don't hear from them and then I see, you know, I, I hear news or whatever else, so they fell away or whatever. That bothers me. Verse 10, Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that your will would be done concerning the timing of the catching away of the body of Christ in terms of uh, how soon it will be. Lord, we know that from the Bible it teaches that it's going to be before the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, Lord, I pray for that day to come. And until then, Lord, I pray that you would keep all of us, keep it in our minds, Lord, that the suffering that we go through here on this earth is, is nothing to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's just such an amazing promise, Lord, that you've given us of, of entering into that rest. Uh, we enter into it in a much better way, Lord, than the time of Jacob's trouble saints do. Um, such precious promises, Lord, that we have. And I thank you so much for those. And I just pray, Lord, for encouragement for all those brethren and out there that are suffering, that are going through some really bad situations, Lord. It just seems like there's no way out. And I know that the way out for a lot of people is just going to be the catching away. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us all to stand strong and not be weary in well-doing. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just want to tell a quick little story here. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be putting this before or after this, but uh, we're actually going to be heading up and going to be showing you uh, we had a pretty bad accident. Um, pretty bad thing happened. It almost cost me my life, actually. <laughs> and... You know, it's. I'll, I'll explain more details when I actually show the video there. But um, we've had that happen, and there was a time here recently, uh, a couple, about a week or two ago. And I'll tell you what, I was just, I was pleading for the Lord to come back. It was so bad. It was, it was the worst spiritual attack I've ever experienced. I mean, it was unreal. And I just thought I can't go on. I just, I cannot, I cannot continue. With life, it just, I mean, I don't know what in the world happened or whatever, but it was, 
it was like the devil and all of his minions were just coming down on me and on my wife. It was just, it was bad. I mean, it was real bad. And uh, what got me through it? Well, it's weird because there are times when I'm suffering and I'm going through some bad times and, and uh, just depression. I mean, I've, I've suffered from really heavy depression. I don't talk about that a lot, but I've, I've been through some real depressing times. And I've had some real serious health issues and things down through the years and, and whatever. don't need to talk about it all. But the point is, uh, there will be times like that when we're just we're suffering and, and it's not good. And all of a sudden, it's just like everything starts to change. And we start to feel the, the, the atmosphere change. And it's like, I know what it is. I know a Christian's praying for us. And, you know, I've, I've gotten different people and they'll say, well, Brother Brian, I can't donate to you right now. I don't have the money and blah, blah, blah. We, we love the donations. We appreciate the donations. We love you that, that donate to us and keep us going. Praise the Lord for you. And, and you'll earn rewards, you know, the judgment seat of Christ for that. Your fellow laborers with us. And we do thank you for that. But I'll tell you what, if I have a choice between prayers and donations, I'll take prayer every single time. Uh, we need your prayers. Um, until you've been in full-time ministry and, you know, this ministry, God placed it in my heart that I'm not ever going to back off and on certain subjects. I'm just, if it's controversial, well, I'm going to come out and I'm going to do my best to show you what the Bible says. Um, but I'm not going to gloss over things and just say, well, that's too controversial. I don't want to talk about it. Um, we've attacked the Jesuits and, and all the Satanists out there and everything else by name when we can. And, and we're going to continue to do so as long as the Lord allows us to. But uh, we really, really appreciate your prayers. And if you're one of our prayer warriors, um, please keep it up. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's important. And I'll tell you what, we need to be in prayer for each other as well. Uh, we have a, a regular habit every night of praying. And we have a whole list of people we pray for, you know. And, and, and then sometimes I just pray for all of the, all of the, the saints out there. You know, the, the brothers and sisters that watch us on YouTube and I mean, we can't remember everybody's name and go through the whole thing. You know, we'd be up all night, you know, but uh, we just we really need to lift each other up in prayer. And this this message, I think the Lord placed it on my heart. There's a bunch of other projects I need to get done, but he really just put this on my heart because I really feel like a lot of you are getting tired because I'm feeling that way. And, you know, you just you get you feel like how much more do we have to go through here? And man, it just like things are getting really bad and it can get very wearying. And I'm telling you, brethren, stay with it. Stay with it because we're close. We're very, very close. And we're getting closer all the time. I mean, I'm just, the Lord could come back this afternoon and there wouldn't be anything that needs to be done for the New World Order Antichrist system to kick in. I mean, it's, it's here. It's ready to go. And uh, so stay with it, brethren. I mean, there's not much more time to go. And in due season, we are going to reap if we faint not. And I'm going to be talking in the future about the thing of getting proper rest. Because like I said, that's a sin that I have been doing. I have not been sleeping correctly. And partly it's because of, of uh, technology, you know, being on the internet too much. That can mess up, you know, your brain waves and things. That you're not going to be able to rest properly, uh, which we're going to be talking about that. Um, you know, you need to limit your time on the internet. And, of course, before you go to bed, you should be off the Internet about two to three hours before you actually go to sleep. And I'll tell you, that will help you a lot if you're having sleep trouble. But there's another technique, which I'm going to actually, I want to see what the Bible says about it. I want to do the study, and we're, in, we're experimenting with it right now. So far, it's amazing. Works very, very well. We're just, we have so much more energy. Um, very interesting. I'll give you something to look forward to. But uh, sleep is very important. And we have to rest so that we can work, so that we can enter into God's rest, if that makes sense. So that is going to be it. Uh, again, please keep us in your prayers, and uh, we will continue to serve the Lord as God permits. And um, I guess that's going to be it. So thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next study.